it's my privilege today to welcome Ishraq Alim, um, got his uh, PhD in physiology and molecular and neuroscience from the University of Toronto. He did a postdoc at Will Cornell Medicine, and uh, he is current, <clears throat> excuse me, currently the senior scientist at Morgan and Mandel Genomics. So Ishraq, welcome. Hey, and thanks for having me, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. It's a privilege to be here with you and the Supreme community as well. Sure. To, to, to take your, That's uh, awesome. Vernacular. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm super glad you're here, and I'm really excited to tell your story. I know um, it's uh, you had a really interesting, interesting route from academia to where you are now. And when you first told me your story, there's some things about it that I've still kind of played over in my mind um, over the last few months because there are some things that stood out as really unique ways to go about job searching. And I'm really excited to share some of those with uh, with the people watching. Um, but just to start kind of first of all, I normally do this in these interviews because um, I'm interviewing a lot of kind of PhDs leaving academia. A lot of people watching are maybe still in academia. Um, why don't you start us off by kind of telling us um, who you were kind of as an academic back at the University of Toronto, uh, the kind of stuff you were studying, kind of stuff you were doing there. Sure, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start from the beginning and and see see uh, all the twists and turns that my career has taken. So I, I did my undergraduate at University of Toronto. Uh, when I kind of started my undergraduate, I, I really wanted to go to medical school. Uh, but I, I guess in my second year, I started doing a lot of research work and uh, I kind of fell in love with research and, uh, you know, really solving uh, uh, big problems that affect a lot of people. And, uh, and, you know, uh, 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 and when you solve those problems, you improve the lives of those individuals as well. Uh, so then I said, okay, how can I pursue a career in research? Uh, the answer was to go to graduate school. So uh, I did my uh, master's at uh, Queen's University, which is in Kingston, Ontario. And then I came back to the University of Toronto to do my PhD, where, you know, you did your PhD as well. It's a, a top tier. Uh, research institution, and when I finished my PhD, I said, okay, I want to become a professor. Uh, how do I become a professor? Uh, so then I decided to go do a postdoc at uh, Wild Cornell, and I was there for a number of years, and uh, during my postdoc, I kind of decided that, you know, becoming a professor was really not suited for what I uh, wanted to do or in both my personal life and my professional life. Uh, you know, uh, we had these conversations on Twitter about uh, that the, uh, uh, I guess, the culture of academia is rapidly changing. Uh, you know, tenure track positions are going away. Uh, job security is going away. You know, uh, uh, funding for younger scientists is rapidly uh, uh, reducing. And, uh, and this ultimately leads to a a uh, crisis for a lot of postdocs and PhD students, including myself. So then I said, okay, you know, how can I uh, continue doing good science, continuing helping people, uh, but not necessarily in academic setting? So uh, that led me to kind of pursue a career in industry. Uh, so this is what they call it in our, in, in the sciences, and I guess it's also in the humanities as well. You go into industry. Uh, so industry can, it, there's a lot of components within industry, but the two areas that uh, uh, initially interested me was more uh, working in big pharma, so like in a big pharmaceutical company, or working for a startup, which is where I currently work. Uh, so both have advantages and disadvantages. Usually working in a big pharmaceutical company, you get paid a lot more money. Your workload is a lot less than you distributed amongst a larger group of people. Uh, working in a startup, you tend to make less money. And, uh, and uh, you know, work is more concentrated on a small group of people. Uh, but the real advantage I liked in working in a startup was that you know, I get to learn about everything that it takes to make a uh, product. Or in our case, we we have we build diagnostic kits for breast and uh, for hereditary breast and colon cancer. So, you know, how do we take it from 
research to a to it to a clinical lab where it's actually helping people. And you know, uh, when you're in a startup, because it's so few people, you kind of are exposed to everything. And that was kind of what I liked about it. Uh, and I like to build things, and uh, I like to. Uh, and and the final reason why I joined a startup is oftentimes when you're in a startup, especially if the startup takes off, uh, and uh, uh, you are often in a kind of a leadership position within that company as opposed to joining a company at a you know entry level or middle management position. Awesome. So I want to talk about startups, but before before we get there, um, talk to me about like talk to me about. So you're you're in academia. You're doing your postdoc. And you realized that this wasn't going to work. <laughs> and uh, I know from our conversation last time that that was um, difficult, first of all, kind of, um, I don't want to put too much on you, I'll let you say it on your words, but I know, and it is you know, almost everybody I talk to, there's a challenging realization. And then the question is kind of, where do I go from here? So why don't you take me back there and tell me what that was like to make that realization. And then kind of, where did you go? Where did you start to think about leaving academia? Yeah. Um, so, so you know, with, when you worked so long in your life for a goal, and you find that find out that it's not going to happen, it hurts, right? I mean, it hurt me. It probably hurt you. It hurt a lot of people. But the thing was, is that I I figured that if I continued on this path, I would it, it there was a significant chance that it wouldn't take me anywhere. Uh, that I I really wanted to go. Uh, so, sorry if I'm being vague. If you want, I can be more specific. Um, uh, like you know, I like early in my postdoc, I got married and I wanted to have a family. And you know, I'd like to spend time with my family and uh, I'd like to provide and and so on and so forth. So being on a postdoc salary, which is you know mid to low five figures, you know, it's it's hard to do that and. Uh, and, and I don't like to make everything about money, but but you know, <laughs> you know, money gives people uh, options in their lives and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, my wife was uh, uh, pushing me and saying, you know, should, you know, you've spent so much time in academia, maybe you should try something new. And then I, I kind of went out there. Um, and so uh, so when I decided to leave academia, I approached it as a problem that I needed to. Uh, so I had to develop strategies on how I can get a non, oh, an alt act or non-academic job, and uh, and I tried to implement as many strategies as possible. So this included, you know, uh, the traditional strategy of you know sending out resumes to people or sending a resume to job postings. Uh, this included things like asking, okay, do I. Uh, uh, asking about you know people I like to be in their position, so I contact uh, senior scientists at certain companies that I want to work for, or people that I'd like to work for. Uh, this was often co uh, uh, cold emails or uh, cold messages on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, I'd try to find people that I you know have something in common with. Uh, I'd Google them on on the internet and, and, and so on and so forth, and uh, I'd reach out to them. I'd uh, usually, when I reach out to them, I uh, although this is no longer available during COVID time, I, I would usually uh, uh, ask to meet them for coffee or for a lunch or something like that. And uh, ninety percent of the time, they say no, and it would be a phone conversation. But you know, sometimes I got I, I went out for coffee with people and I met people for lunch and I got their input. And uh, you know, even if they said that, uh, and, and usually when I approach them, I didn't approach them. Asking for a job, I approach them and say, in saying, "Hey, you are in X, Y, and Z position. How did you get there? Uh, are you willing for me? Uh, are, are are you willing to let me, you know, pick your brain for thirty minutes over a coffee, to, just just over that?" And oftentimes they uh, uh, they would tell us, and you know, these people are smart and they know that you're reaching out to them because you are interested in pursuing that career as well. And uh, sometimes they would. You know, uh, if they were hiring, they would take your resume. Uh, or uh, if they knew somebody else in another department that was hiring, they you know forward their resume to them, and and so on and so forth. So those were kind of my two 
primary approaches. I also would, uh, you know, go to fairs. And uh, the third thing, uh, uh, the fourth thing that I did uh, uh, was that uh, coming from academia and going to this, like a, a more industry business situation, I, I really lacked a business background. So I would often, you know, uh, uh, take, say, online classes or go to, uh, because I'm in New York City, I, I'd go to Columbia University and I would connect with people in, you know, actual science department or business department and uh, uh, just to try to pick their brain about, you know, uh, uh, kind of some of the basics surrounding business and finance and so on and so forth. And, and I'm not claiming to be an expert in that area. You know, those guys went to school for many years. I just like to have an introduction. That's awesome. I, I uh, no, I did something similar myself, and that's, that's really cool. Um, so I hear you saying like four things basically. Um, you kind of <laughs> threw out resumes, you networked, you um, went to kind of occasional live events, and uh, you mm-hmm. did some kind of learning to prepare yourself. Um, mm-hmm. What uh, I, I have to ask this question because it's just something I think about a lot. Um, how high up would you say sending out resumes to job applications? was in terms of like landing you a job. Did that have anything to do with it? Or I, I want to get to the real story later, but just real quick, is it effective or, or generally speaking, did you find you were throwing them into a black hole? <laughs> it's, it's hard for me to prioritize because I implemented all, yeah, all, yeah. Uh, all of those strategies at once. Yeah. Um, I will say that you know, for you to get an interview, you will have to send out 100 or 200 resumes yeah. to 100 or 200 job posts before you get, you know, all five to 10 interviews. Yeah. I just, I just, uh, I, so, 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 so if you, so if you want to say that's a black hole, sure, it's a black hole, but you know, <laughs> some people implement that strategy and they move forward. Uh, I, I mean, my recommendation is to implement as many strategies as possible. Yeah, that's and, fair. and I mentioned this to you before that I, 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 I kind of had a regimen that I would send out five resumes every day to job posting. I would, you know, contact cold, cold email or cold contact one to three people every day. Uh, oftentimes, even that route, you know, I cold email somebody, I find out their company email and I send them a very nice email and, you know, they wouldn't respond and that's fine. And, uh, you know, and some people did. Generally, my hit rate was higher. Uh, when I cold emailed or cold contacted people, say, you know, if, if, uh, if sending out resumes is a 5% hit, you know, cold emails was about a 25 to 50% hit rate. No, that's really cool. Um, I think the, the thing that, the thing that stood out to me was, um, when you talk about, about networking, because I had this experience too, that you, you sit with somebody and usually at the end of the conversation, they would either be trying to say, like, can I have your resume to have on file or something? And or maybe like I might know someone who is hiring, send me your resume. And then like it's funny for me how many of those networking conversations, like once you get in front of somebody, means at that point, like your resume is gonna get read. And it doesn't always that doesn't always happen from submitting. But again, like I, I do agree because I've heard of people getting jobs from sending in resumes too. So like both definitely happens. Um, I just I love networking too. Um, and I love the um I, I really love it. So, so Chris, uh, uh, Chris uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. I, I, I just wanted to add, uh, since we're talking about hit rates, if you can get in front of a person and if you, you, know, you have a nice conversation with them, in my experience, 100% of the time, they will ask you for your resume. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> and um, no, I love the learning thing too, learning business, learning. So this is... You told me this story when we first when we first spoke. I wonder if I can uh, come to this. Um, tell me about how you almost might maybe might have had a career as an equities researcher. <laughs> so 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 uh, it's, it, it, so my story was uh, I, I I guess the story I just told you guys was a little bit too linear and I and. Uh, uh, and uh, I guess you really want to know about all the past, <laughs> other alternative paths that I've taken and ultimately failed. <laughs> so, yeah. So, kind of going back to being a postdoc and, uh, uh, and 
and and kind of being a little bit disillusioned with academia. I I I kind of asked myself, okay, I, I I'd like to live in New York City. What are some of the jobs available for a PhD? So obviously, I went on LinkedIn, I went on Indeed, and all these job sites, and I said, okay, PhD New York. And the number one job hit, hit, hit in New York City is uh, uh, equity is biotechnic research associates. Uh, so these are essentially people who um, uh, uh, and I mean the most simplest way to say who these people are is is they kind of pick stock. So they work for an investment bank. Uh, usually they have a PhD. Uh, their portfolio is largely. Uh, biotech companies. So uh, biotech companies are usually uh, uh, they usually don't have a, a cash flow. They're usually R and D based. They don't have a product, so they have to evaluate the value of those companies somehow. So they evaluate it based on their science. So they hire these people who have PhDs, and they evaluate these companies and they say, okay, this company has legitimate, you know, uh, research, and they have a market that is growing or uh, is. Ha- is unmet and, and so on and so forth. So uh, actually, that was kind of the reason why I went into business because, oh, I, oh well, I, I studied a lot of business because I wanted to kind of uh, uh, merge some more a business aspect uh, of stock picking and uh, and my science background to get into biotech and computer research. Uh, I, I did go for a few interviews. Um, ultimately, it uh, uh, I, uh, a lot of the interviews I failed, and uh, um, but ultimately I, I I decided not to pursue that route because it would not fit uh, the lifestyle that I wanted. I, I uh, when when you work for an investment bank, especially as an equity researcher, or even as a uh, 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 even on the buy side as an investment bank or something like that, you're often kind of chain to your desk between market hours, you really don't have that flexibility. Uh, I mean, working in a startup, it, it is long hours, but it is not. I do have flexibility, like if I need to go run an errand in the middle of the day, or if I need to talk to you in the middle of the day, you know, I can take an hour off and I can chat with you and then go back to work and so on and so forth. So but if I was at, uh, you know, uh, at an investment bank, um, my duty is to to the clients of those investment banks. Yeah, I, I so. <laughs> no, I love it. the reason why I got you to tell that. Not not just because I mean it might be interesting to uh, to people who are watching to know that uh, equity researching is a possibility. Yeah. Um, but also because I love I love the the image that you kind of gave me when you first told me that story. And just now it is of you going to Columbia and tracking down some business students. And I remember you telling me this story of getting them to help you write a stock a stock pitch. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, what I did was I. Um, so I, I I was at Wild for now. So if 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 you know if, if you know the uh, uh, kind of the uh, uh, layout of Manhattan, you know Wild Cornell and Columbia are kind of opposite sides of the city. So uh, every evening uh, I you know I signed up for some consulting clubs and business clubs at Columbia, and every evening after I was done at the lab, I would you know go across the city to Columbia and sit with a, a lot of master's students and PhD students as well as undergrads and say, okay, you know, I'm, I, I, I know nothing about this area. How can we help? And a lot of them were actually quite interested in the science too, because many of them are business students who were interested in uh, biotech and pharma industry. So I could explain to them a little bit about the science and they could explain to me a little bit about the business. But uh, I guess I guess the term you're looking for is hustle. So so I'll, 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 uh, in addition to strategy, uh, in my job search, in my job search, I, I I had a lot of hustle. I I go around. I try to meet people. You know, if I had to go for a lunch, you know, I would uh, kind of duck out of the lab for an hour, take the train somewhere, uh, or take my car somewhere and meet somebody for thirty minutes to an hour for lunch or coffee, and then come back. And and so on and so forth. So so it is a lot of work, unfortunately. But you know, well, I, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a means to an end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You do what you gotta do. So I, <laughs> I love that story because it's. I mean, and first of all, like the people watching, you don't necessarily have to do that to land a job. Like I don't want everybody to think that 
you know, if you're not going to another university and getting students to do it at night after everything else you do, like, like there may be, that may not be within your wheelhouse. But the thing I love about it is, is the creativity that you uh, approach job searching with, that you're like, here's a skill I don't have. And instead of saying, well, too bad, it can't be an equities, equity research because I don't have a business background. You said to yourself, like, how the heck can I get this? And how can I, you know, build this skill set? And, and to me, that's an attitude. I love that attitude. I wish more people would bring that to their, to their kind of career searching to have that, that level of yes, hustle, but also just like, like resourcefulness, you know, like, where can I get the information I need and how can I just to make myself the most, um, the most interesting candidate that, you know, this, this uh, firm is going to see or whatever. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, uh, like, like when you're moving back to the image industry, uh, for a lot of people, you're a little bit of an unknown. So uh, one way is to actually prove yourself by doing work. And, you know, like I like, like, like you mentioned, you know, writing a stock pitch, right? You know, as a PhD student in neuroscience, I, I had no experience writing a stock pitch. So I had to go and figure out how to do it. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention that you, you kind of highlighted is that I, that I think a lot of PhDs have kind of ingrained in them is the ability to solve problems and the ability to systematically approach a problem at, at, in, in order to resolve it and, and, and do whatever it needs to take to resolve that problem, right? Um, which I think a lot of, which is not really taught in undergrad. And it's to some extent taught at a master's level, especially the research masters. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's my kind of personal advice to anybody looking for a uh, uh, looking for uh, a, even a career in academia or a career outside of academia is, you know, really approach it as a problem that needs to be solved. And, and that's how I kind of approach everything in life, in, including my work that uh, at, at the startup where I, I view that we have certain, certain problems that we need to solve and how do we go about solving them. I, um, I interviewed uh, Lindy Lenowski a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you know she is, but she runs uh, an English, well, sorry, she, she was an English prof, quit and now runs an ed tech startup. And uh, mm -hmm. it was the same thing. It was a story of her like, not knowing really what she could do, but going and dropping into like every single possible. She said if, if there was an opening at like a store and they were having an opening, she'd go be shaking hands and meeting people and just trying to do everything you can to get yourself out there and learn about the world and figure out like what I bring to the world. So I love, I just love that. I love these kind of stories, but um, you know, so I'm a sucker for a hustle story, I guess. I, I, I read, I, I read your interview with her. It was, it was really fantastic. And, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, although uh, me and her, I mean, you are from different fields. I think there is that commonality of, you know, uh, you know, uh, pursue as many routes as possible uh, to, to, to come to your end goal. Um, and, and, and a lot of job searching, unfortunately, is a numbers game that like, you know, you just got to luck out and, you know, some people, it takes a few months for them to luck out and some people it takes a few days to luck out and so on. Yeah, exactly. But the good news is it's, it's a better numbers game than I could be <laughs> overall. <laughs> numbers are a lot better. Um, so I, I, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, okay. Anyways, moving on. Just to say that instead of competing for one or two jobs, you know there are hundreds you could potentially do. Right? <laughs> about finding the right one. But um, so yeah. so coming coming to um, okay. So away from the equities research now, um, you you okay. eventually got a job. So how did how did that happen? Like where like what was um, that process? I think if I remember correctly, you may have had a couple of different possibilities right near the end, and you landed where you are. Can you walk me through that process in a little more detail? Like what that looked like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 um, oh man, this is a depressing story. <laughs> so initially, you know, I was really not getting in. Like I was, you know, uh, cold calling people and, uh, uh, you know, uh, sending out resumes and I really wasn't getting in. But, but the real advantage I felt with the, the continual failures or like quote unquote failures that I had, that I had, was that it allowed me to kind of modify, you know, how I present myself in my resume. Uh, how do I present myself in a cold, uh, a cold email? Uh, so, for example, initially when I was sending cold emails, I was sending people on my resume, which, you know, uh, a friend of mine I, I, I talked to said that, he said, don't do that. Send somebody a, a, a cold email. You know, uh, they know you're looking for a job uh, and they can look you up on LinkedIn. Just send them an honest email 
that says, hey, I want to meet you and I want to learn about you. And, you know, uh, people love talking about themselves. So, uh, you know, that was uh, uh, one one issue that I had to overcome. You know, I had to modify my uh, resume, make it, uh, make it so that my resume is two pages, but the first page, you can read the first page and get at all the information that you need. And the, and the second page is largely so hard. And, and so on and so forth. And then over time, you know, I was getting hit. And by the end, and, and then initially I was getting uh, uh, phone interviews. Uh, 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 so the first one or two phone interviews didn't go beyond the phone interview, and that's fine. And I kind of figured out, you know, uh, uh, like, what did I say wrong? Or how do I approach this? And I would talk to people and things like that. And then they would read to interviews, and then I, I, I was getting multiple interviews every week, and then I was getting multiple job offers, and then uh, when you get multiple job offers, you have the luxury of making a decision of what you'd like, um, and, uh, you know, uh, so I had to take into uh, consideration, uh, you know, uh, does the company that I'm going to work for, uh, are they doing a project that I feel? Uh, can come to fruition and is something that interests me. Uh, and, uh, you know, is this a company that has good culture? You know, is this something, is this a company that's going to respect me and respect my opinion and so on and so forth? And then, you know, that's something I found at Morgan and Mental Genomics. And, uh, you know, I've been here for over a year and it's, uh, uh, so it's, it's great and I love it every day. <laughs> so I want to, I want to ask you a bit more about Morgan and Mandel and kind of the work you're doing because especially when you're a startup, a lot of people hear startup and they think like, like Silicon Valley and venture capitalists and like going to be the next Uber, um, which I'm going to be wrong. I hope you, I hope you will be. But um, the point is, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a different world, right? Like that when we say startup, like, can you talk to us about like what kind of what your work looks like, what the company looks like, the structure of it, and like how kind of how you fit as senior scientist, how you fit within that, within the company. Yeah. So um yeah, so most people think of tech startups. Uh, we're not a tech startup. We're not building an app or something like that. We are a biotech startup. So biotech usually involves either, uh, either uh, it can involve a lot of different things, uh, but it, usually it's, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals and you have a drug or a treatment, or it's some sort of diagnostic, which is what we are, where, you know, we have a test that, uh, uh, essentially, uh, so we have a pr proprietary technology that we're implementing as a clinical test to test uh, risk for a, a breast cancer, a hereditary breast cancer, or hereditary colon cancer. Uh, so those are the two products in our pipeline. Uh, we are not funded by venture capital. Uh, you know, uh, I have friends who work in venture capital, and it's, it's great, but you know, venture capital. Uh, you often sell a portion of your company to 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 uh, be in venture capital. Our founders decided not to, it, not to initially pursue the venture capital route. We'll, we may pursue it later. We will probably pursue it later on. We're uh, government funded, so we have a government grant. Uh, in, so in the U.S., there is a grant called uh, an SB, SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research, or SDTR, Small Business Technology Transfer Research. Uh, and these are usually uh, cutting, uh, these are usually uh, government grants from different sectors of the government that they use to fund uh, cutting edge technology. And it usually deems whatever product you're producing to be of the uh, interest of the US government. And I believe the Canadian government has, has similar types of grants. Oftentimes, uh, these start, particularly in the biotech space, oftentimes these startups start from an academic lab. So this technology is discovered at a uh, uh, academic lab at uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and then it kind of spun out into a company, and, 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 I, and I joined this company. Um, yeah, uh, so you, and, yeah, I was just going to say, and oh, yeah. by the way, the, the Canadian equivalent, I believe, is IRAP, which is the Industrial Research Assistant Program, which mm -hmm. is so, um, just if there's anybody watching who's curious. Um, so you, um, so what, can you tell us a little bit about like your day to day? Like, what is it, what, what does the life of a senior scientist look like in your, in your shoes? I'm sure there's a lot of differences depending on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
my my day to day will vary. Um, so usually my day is split between research work, uh, uh, this can be laboratory work or uh, reading papers and and, and, and research. Uh, uh, my day also includes a lot of meetings. So I have to go to a lot of uh, Zoom meetings and uh, and uh, uh, through various topics from intellectual property to vendors to you know, collaborators uh, within the academic sector, uh, as well as physicians and, and so on and so forth. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of my day. It, it, it varies from time to time. Uh, oftentimes, it, uh, uh, my schedule can change very rapidly if, if, if we need to do something very quickly or uh, something comes up or if we get an important email or, or, or anything like that. So what's what's different now about like the type of research you do now versus like the type of research you were doing in the academy? Is, is there much oh, of a difference? And there is. Uh, so uh, I'm a neuroscientist by training. My focus is largely on neurodegenerative disorders. And I now work in cancer risk assessment. So that is you know, different areas, but a lot of the molecular mechanisms overlap. So I think that's why I was kind of uh, 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 brought on board because I, I, I know a lot of the uh, stress response mechanisms that uh, fail during neurodegeneration or during uh, cancer. And, uh, and I was able to, uh, you know, uh, kind of parlay my skills from neuroscience into this. Uh, in addition, um, you know, I have a lot of like laboratory skills that uh, uh, were of interest uh, to the company. Uh, I'm also a critical thinker, which people seem to like, and uh, and yeah, that's about it. Uh, but also joining the uh, uh, joining a company that uh, is, is not doing exactly what I was doing before. You know, there's a little bit of a learning curve and I have to you know, read a lot of papers and learn a lot of things. Yeah. Now for people, so like for somebody watching who thinks that, because we talk about leaving academia, I confess, I mean, I'm a little too, even on Twitter, I'm a little too provocative sometimes because not, not everybody completely, like leaving academia in that sense doesn't necessarily mean you cut all ties and you're never, never step foot in the university again, right? Like it's, there's a, there's no. some crossover there and there, there is for me too. And I think like for a lot of people I talk to, um, but I think that might be surprising. So what what you still have like some relationships in the university, is that right? Like and like how does how does that work in terms of your work and, and that kind of balance? Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, we uh, uh, like we 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 present at a lot of uh, academic meetings, uh, uh, a lot of society meetings, uh, where where it's you know nine uh, like maybe not ninety, maybe eighty percent academia. Uh, 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 twenty percent industry. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, if it, it, uh, 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 we're planning on running some clinical trials, so when we do run clinical trials, it'll it's going to have to be through academic institutions, through academic hospitals, and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's not like we're not cutting the tie, and and a lot of our uh, our uh, scientific advisory committee, so our entire scientific advisory committee is is made up of professors and academics who are still in the field and you know are interested in advising in our in our product and uh, 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 helping it hit market. And so I I I don't think that you know leaving uh, academia is is a hard cutoff. You know I I still work with a lot of brilliant academics. I still have plenty of friends that I did my PhD and postdoc with, with who are assistant professors and you know they're great people and I enjoy discussing their work and you know they sometimes send me papers to read and you know I sometimes uh, uh, you know uh, if I need some help I, I may contact reach out to them and ask them for help uh, uh, depending on what type of help I need and so on. That's really cool I think yeah I think that may be comforting to some people who, who like you know, like certain parts of the academy and maybe not even all of it, but um, want to 
still kind of keep their 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 toe in it kind of and i think it's maybe comforting to know that you still can have those kind of connections and relationships and it doesn't necessarily mean like they're never gonna hear from you again kind of thing um i want to ask one more thing and then i want to get to some more like kind of generic career advice and uh i want to ask the purpose the purpose question that i always ask but um first of all so what what changes when you're thinking about like creating a product versus like the type of academic research you were doing what what how does that like orient what you're doing differently what like what what changes in that so 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 i think the business model uh in academia is different than in industry uh, i know a lot of academics don't like using the word business model but it it is a business model so basically in academia you do some research you publish papers that are hopefully high impact those high impact papers are read by the community you use that you use those papers to develop new ideas you apply for grants and then that money comes back in and then you kind of go back and do research and fulfill those grants and, and so on and so forth it's, it's heavily dependent on grant money and and or foundation money in in more uh industry uh yes your initial funding can be grant money or vc money or some sort of angel investor money who who basically buy into your company uh uh, uh, government money usually doesn't buy into the company. They give you money uh, in, uh, in hope for getting exclusive contracts in the future. I'm not going to get too much into that, but uh, uh, but uh, but your ultimate goal is to produce a product. That product sells. You make money off of it, and that money goes back, hopefully, back into R and D, and then it it it, it can uh, produce new products that goes into market and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you know. Your sources of money kind of changes. Your approach kind of changes. Uh, you know, in academia, there's no uh, uh, because you're getting grant money. There's no push to producing a product. And most, uh, 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 but I will say that many academics who do want to produce produce a product will start a startup out of their lab or out of their institution or something like that, which you know, is, is becoming very common. Today. I want to ask about the career advice that you would have for somebody starting out, somebody in your shoes, not in your shoes now, but somebody who's, you know, in their, their final two years of the PhD or maybe in a postdoc, um, what would you say to them about uh, getting started on building their career? Yeah, I, w I, w I, w I would say, uh, I would say first they've already, already built a lot of their career because, you know, uh, I, 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 I commend people who have pursued graduate studies because oftentimes it's very difficult to get into graduate studies and, and, and you know, doing a master's and PhD and, and so on and so forth. So some of my advice is kind of goes back to what I was saying before that, uh, you know, you need to be a, uh, you need to develop a strategy and you need to develop multiple strategies and implement those strategies. Uh, you need to kind of approach it as, okay, uh, I'd like to have a career as X how do I get to that level, right? And uh, you, you know, you develop strategies and implement those strategies, and keep working hard. Uh, the other thing I would say is, is, do not be afraid of failure. Uh, oftentimes, you know, like I was telling you about hit rates, right? Like I, uh, I know a lot of people who send out a res, who find a perfect job posting and send out a resume and never hear back from them, and they feel terrible about themselves. And the third. Uh, uh, Thing is that be persistent. You know, it's it's a long process. It's it's not a your career is not a short process that's going to be five days and you know you're, you're going to be where you're at. It's, it's always it's a long process and it's always a changing process. So you need to kind of keep that and don't be discouraged. And and I think I mentioned to you that I that that, that I that my that my partner was very supportive of me and. Uh, and, uh, oftentimes, people have uh, either a partner or, or or somebody in their family that uh, you know, uh, or a friend or something that is supportive. And it's always good to have that person kind yeah. of have somebody push you along. Kind of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Good advice. Um, so, lastly, the the question of purpose. So, Rooster and I, I mean, I think a lot about purpose and both the purpose that we sometimes ascribe to being academics and and the kind of um, a lot of people, you know, have expectations about what that role looks like and what it's going to feel like and all this sort of thing. And one of the things I love asking people who left academia is, 
is it, <laughs> is it reward? Like, where do you, where do you find purpose in what you do? Do you love it? Like what's, what's really rewarding about it? Um, just to kind of go out on a high note, wouldn't mind sharing a few reflections about that. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, like, like I'll first say people get purpose from a lot of different places yeah. and it doesn't affect their career, or their home. So for me, for my purpose of my career, is that is is twofold. One, um, I, I I really like uh, uh, kind of solving problems. Like I feel that like you know the work that I'm doing right now is really going to solve an issue that exists within the medical sphere. Um, although I would, uh, although I personally would like to solve all problems in the world, I I, I I'm currently focusing on this one. <laughs> Uh, and the second is, is that uh, in my pursuit of resolving this problem, I'd like to improve the lives of people and help people in some way. Uh, I, um, and I feel like I'm doing that. You know, breast cancer, colon cancer, uh, hereditary breast cancer, colon cancer is a very serious issue. You know, many people have family members who have had it. You know, uh, many uh, people have, you know, uh, 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 people who they've looked up to who've had it. I mean, the most recent example is Chadwick Boseman uh, uh, recently passed away of colon cancer, right? And and you know his character Black Panther meant a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, um, and uh, I'm just using it as an example, but you know, you know he's he's somebody important to a lot of people's lives, and you know some and a lot of people may have uh, you know uncles and aunts, parents, uh, siblings, you know. Who, may be suffering from them and it's and 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 those people are very important in their lives and I'd like to help as many people as I possibly can. Right. Shrek, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to uh, to hear from you and hear your story. It's really inspiring yeah. as always. I hope it's uh, I hope it's gonna challenge people watching both both challenge and uh, kind of help push them push them to take those next steps which you outlined really well and uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure being here. I'm always happy to help you out. I'm always happy to help out anybody who has questions or anything. Awesome, thanks.